biology. So let's now look at the liver. So for the liver, we see that the liver is the largest internal organ in the body. So this is the largest internal organ. So the skin is the largest external organ, uh, while the liver is the largest internal organ. But if you look at the organs as a whole, we see that the skin is the largest organ in the body. So for this liver, we see that it lies below the diaphragm and it receives blood from the hepatic artery, which is a branch of the aorta. So after receiving blood from the hepatic artery, we see that it also receives blood from the hepatic portal vein, which is a branch of the stomach and the intestines, as you can see in the diagram. So it receives blood from the hepatic artery, which is a branch of the aorta. Apart from that, it also receives blood from the hepatic portal vein, which is a branch of the stomach and the intestine. So by this, you can see that blood from the stomach and the intestines must first of all pass through the liver before they go to the general circulation. So there is a reason for that. Blood from the stomach and the intestine are not allowed first of all to go uh, to enter into the bloodstream directly. So they must first of all pass through the liver and then after passing through the liver, now the liver returns blood back to the bloodstream by the use of hepatic vein. So again remember, the hepatic artery supplies the liver with oxygenated blood. That is the first blood vessel which brings blood back to the liver. Apart from that, we have the hepatic portal vein, which also brings back blood, uh, yeah, which also supplies the liver with blood. So this vein is now found in, originates from the stomach and the intestines, then it enters into the liver. So the liver now has hepatic vein which now removes blood from the liver and takes it back into the bloodstream as the diagram shows. So remember those three blood vessels, hepatic artery, hepatic portal vein and the hepatic vein. So as we said, remember this is the largest internal organ of the body. So by that, let's now look at the functions of the liver. So what are the functions of the liver? Why is it that food, first of all, from the stomach and the intestine must pass through the liver. That blood from the stomach and the intestine must pass through the liver and now into the general circulatory system. So that gets us to know the functions of the liver. So the first function of the liver, we have deamination. So anytime you hear deamination, you just picture amino acids and proteins. Deamination, amino acids. To deaminate is like to break down amino acids. So what is deamination? So this is the breakdown of excess amino acids in the liver. That is deamination. So it's the breakdown of excess amino acids in the liver. So for the formation of urea in the liver, we see that hydrogen is added to, to an amino group to form ammonia. That is for the formation of the urea. As you can look at this equation, whereby we have an amine added to, to hydrogen to form ammonia gas. So this ammonia gas that has been formed, it is reacted with carbon dioxide in the orthenine cycle. So again, hydrogen is added to an amine group to form ammonia. And so this is the formation of urea. So how is urea formed under deamination? So in the amino group, we add hydrogen uh, molecule. So if you if we add hydrogen, we are going to get ammonia gas as you can look at the equation. So this ammonia gas that has been formed is reacted with carbon four oxide in the orthenine cycle by the use of arginase enzyme. So by the use of the arginase enzyme. So in the orthenine cycle by the use of arginase enzyme, therefore we are going to get urea. As you can see, so we are going to get urea. After urea, we are going to get traces of water molecules. So don't forget that formation of urea under deamination. So it begins by amino group reacting with hydrogen to get ammonia. After obtaining ammonia, the ammonia reacts with carbon four oxide in orthenine cycle under enzyme arginase. So when these two react under this enzyme arginase, we are going to get urea plus water molecules. That is the urea that was formed. So this urea obviously dissolves in water to form urine. 
So this urea, urea is a solid, so urea dissolves in water. So picture urea like a powder. So powder is dissolved in water. So that's why you have urea plus water. So it dissolves in water to form now urine. So here we see that the urine is carried in the bloodstream and to the kidneys for excretion, whereby in the kidneys, remember we say that through the nephrons, we can be able to obtain urine, which is taken to the pelvis, to the bladder, and then excreted. So the urea formed here is then now carried to the blood and taken to the kidneys, whereby excretion of now this urea is going to take place. So the remaining carbonyl group, uh, yeah, so the remaining carbonyl group after the removal of the amino acid group is either oxidized to provide energy in respiration, because in respiration, remember, we need oxygen. So the remaining carbonyl group is either oxidized to provide energy under respiration or built into carbohydrates and then after, built, uh, after being built into carbohydrates is stored under the skin as fat deposits. So that is exactly what happens. So the remaining, uh, the remaining products, so they are either oxidized to produce the immediate energy, this energy that I'm using right now. It's oxidized to provide this immediate energy, or if there's energy already, so the carbonyl group will be converted to uh, will be converted to glycogen and stored in the liver, or will be converted to fats and stored under the skin. So that is deamination. So deamination, remember, this is the breakdown <coughs> of excess amino acids in the blood. So the breakdown of excess amino acids in the blood in order to form urea. And for that equation that we saw, that is how urea is formed. Amino group reacting with hydrogen, the, um, uh, the ammonia gas reacting with carbon dioxide to form urea. So the second function of the liver is now detoxification. So what is detoxification? So simply this is the process of removing toxins from the blood. Also, some toxins under detoxification will be converted to less harmful toxins. That is detoxification. So you see that under the normal process of respiration, hydrogen peroxide is basically broken down to yeah, it's, a, it's broken down by by enzyme catalase to form water and oxygen. Exactly. So hydrogen peroxide is broken down uh, by enzyme catalase to form water and oxygen, which is basically harmless to the body. So in this equation, uh, we can see the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide because excess hydrogen peroxide in the body is poisonous. So this hydrogen peroxide under detoxification is always broken down to water molecules and oxygen in the body by the use of enzyme catalase. So this enzyme catalase is the one responsible in the liver. Enzyme catalase in the liver is the one responsible to break down hydrogen peroxide, which is produced by the tissues and the cells, to water molecules and oxygen gas. So that is under detoxification. Also for the liver, we see that under detoxification, liver is the one responsible to remove excess alcohol from the blood. So for a drunkard who has taken excess alcohol, so liver is the one responsible to filter out excess alcohol and remove the excess alcohol from the blood. Apart from that, we see that if someone has taken poison, either either camphor or they have taken either sulfur poison or they have taken rat rat poison. So it is the function of the liver to try to remove these toxins from the blood. So the function of liver is to remove toxin, to detoxify the blood. If there is any poison in the, in the blood, liver tries as much as possible to remove the poisons from the bloodstream. So under that, that uh, that's the function of liver, which is referred to as detoxification. So apart from detoxification, let's now look at the other function of the liver now, which is now production of bile juice. So this bile juice production, we see that bile juice is essential in the process of in the process of digestion, whereby the the main function of bile juice is emulsification. What did you say emulsification was? This was the process whereby large fat uh, droplets were converted to oil. So it's the process of breaking down large fat droplets to oil in the liver, in the process called emulsification. Apart from emulsification, we see that bile juice also contains sodium taurocolate and sodium glycocolate. Whereby the function of the taurocolate and glycocolate 
is to neutralize the acidic chime that is coming from the stomach. So that was also the function of the bile juice emulsification and also neutralizing the acidity of the chyme by the use of sodium, glyco, and taurocholate. So you see that where is the bile juice produced? So how is the bile juice produced in the liver? So you see that bile is produced by the breakdown of dead red blood cells, whereby we see that red blood cells have a lifespan of about four months. So they have a lifespan of about three to four months. That is the red blood cells. So from the breakdown of the, these red blood cells, which have hemoglobin. So from the breakdown of the red blood cells, we have bile juice. So we see that after four months, the red blood cells are taken to the liver and broken down. So the hemoglobin contained in the red blood cell is broken down into two, uh, to two substances. Yeah, it's broken down to two substances. So the first one is heim, H-A-E-M, and then the next one is globulin. So hemoglobin in the liver will be broken down to heim and the globulin. So the heim is responsible for the transportation of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the bloodstream. That is the function of heim, for the transportation of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the bloodstream. So the excess heim, we see that it is broken down to form bilirubin and... Yeah, it's broken down to form uh, bilirubin. So this bilirubin is then taken to the gallbladder and it's then released into the duodenum for excretion. So as all the food substances that have been ingested will be taken for excretion, also that is how liver removes the excess, mm, the excess bilirubin or the waste bilirubin that were formed from the breakdown of the hemoglobin. So it is taken to the gallbladder and as bile juice will be released, so bilirubin, excess bilirubin will also be released and then it will be adjusted in the process of adjustion. So apart from that, let's continue. So we see that, like, okay, we say that the function of HIM was transportation of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So that is what we say that was the function of HIM. So in other hand, we see that the globulin is digested into amino acid or the globulin is converted into amino acid, whereby the function of the globulin now here will be uh, to facilitate the blood clotting process. That is one. So the first one is to facilitate the blood clotting process as well as fighting the different infection in the body. So it is also used for the production of the different white blood cells in the body uh, which will be used for fighting different infections of the body. So HIM responsible for transportation of oxygen and carbon dioxide, globulin, blood clotting process and fighting infections in the body. Why? It is used in the manufacture and synthesis of different white blood cells in the body. So the other function of liver is excretion of cholesterol from the blood. So excretion of excess cholesterol in the blood. If one takes a lot of chips, a lot of bajia, a lot of chicken, a lot of nyamachoma, so if one takes a lot of everything, these foods which have high cholesterol, so the function of the liver now is now to filter out the excess cholesterol from the blood and then remove this excess cholesterol from the blood. Because you see that the fats found in the diet are broken down in the process of emulsification. That is how they are removed. So eating a lot of fat, eating a lot of uh, animal, animal feed, they give a lot of fat. So this fat will be broken down in the process of emulsification, whereby the large fat molecules will be broken down to small oil droplets in the body. So you see that excess fat in the body is very much harmful because it can be able to lead to, it can bring diseases. Remember we say that obesity is bad. Obesity can be able to predispose one to very many diseases. The same here, excess fat in the body can lead to very many diseases. Like for example, we have atherosclerosis that we discussed in transport in plants and animals previously. It can lead to gallstones, it can lead to heart attack, it can also lead to stroke. Obesity is very, is not good. Intake of excess cholesterol also is not good at any cost. So the next function of the liver, we have regulation of blood sugar level. That's the other function of liver, to regulate blood sugar level. 
So you see that most sugars found in meals are taken to the liver and converted to glucose whereby starch will be broken down to form glucose, whereby this food will be broken down to form glucose, that food. So you see that some glucose is used to provide immediate energy. Now this energy that I'm using right now. Some glucose is used to provide this immediate energy. While excess glucose will be stored if the glucose is now in excess. So this excess glucose will be taken and then stored in the liver as glycogen molecules. So remember, immediate energy uh, some glucose will be used to provide me with immediate energy energy to walk energy to run energy to do that this energy to do that while excess of the glucose will now be stored in the liver to as energy reserve so it will be stored in the liver as glycogen this glycogen will only be broken down when i'm feeling hungry the liver will break down the glycogen and supply the cells of my body with uh, carbohydrates which will give them energy yeah, which will give them energy. So you see that some of the excess carbohydrate also, like okay, some excess carbohydrates will be stored as glycogen in the liver. Some excess carbohydrate will be stored under the skin uh, as in the form of fats. In the subcutaneous fat layer, you remember the one that we talked about previously? So some of the excess carbohydrate will be stored under the skin as fat deposits in the subcutaneous fat fat layer. So you see that the more exercise one does, the more intake of glucose is required in the bloodstream. Whereby you see that normal glucose level in the blood should be about 100 milligrams per 100 centimeters cubed. So this means that it is 1 milligram per 1 centimeter cubed. So that ranges about the normal glucose level that one should have in their body. So if the level of glucose goes down in blood, that is the level of glucose. If the level of glucose begins to decline if the level of glucose begins to go down in the bloodstream what will happen is that this organ pancreas so the pancreas is going to stimulate the liver to produce glucose uh, it's going to stimulate liver to break down the glycogen molecules in order to form to form the carbohydrates in the bloodstream or to make the bloodstream have carbohydrates so what will happen is that the pancreas is going to release glucagon hormone. So if the pancreas releases glucagon hormone, this glucagon hormone is going to go to the liver. If the glucagon hormone has gone into the liver, this glucagon hormone is going to stimulate the liver to break down glycogen to carbohydrates. If the glycogen will be broken down to carbohydrates, it will mean that there will be enough sugar in the bloodstream. This enough sugar in the bloodstream is going to give cells and the tissues of the body, uh, they require energy to continue their daily activities. So that is how the process goes. If the sugar level in the blood goes down, the pancreas releases glucagon hormone. This glucagon hormones will go to the liver, and then after it has gone to the liver, it will stimulate the liver to, produce, uh, to break down glycogen. So the liver is going to break down glycogen to form carbohydrates, these carbohydrates are going to enter into the bloodstream and then they are going to be distributed in the cells and the tissues thereby producing energy for the cells to continue functioning. So, this hormone basically glycogen. Glycogen is mainly used to increase the sugar level. Not glycogen, glucagon hormone produced by the pancreas. It is basically used to increase the sugar level in the blood. Whereby we see that if sugar level in the blood again now becomes extremely high the pancreas is now going to produce insulin hormone whereby after pancreas has produced insulin hormone the function of this insulin hormone is that it is going to it is going to limit the production of glucagon hormone in short if insulin hormone is will be produced glucagon hormone will not be produced if glucagon hormone will not be produced therefore it will mean that Glycogen in the liver will not be broken down to carbohydrates, monosaccharides. It's, it will not be broken down. So thereby it will mean that the presence of insulin hormone is going to reduce the sugar level in the bloodstream. So remember, pancreas produces two hormones. It produces glucagon hormone which increases the blood sugar level. If the blood sugar level becomes too much extreme, 
pancreas will produce another hormone which is called insulin. The function of insulin hormone is that the insulin hormone is going to reduce the blood sugar level. So by that you can say that the pancreas serves two functions. So the first function is to increase the blood sugar level and also uh, is to increase the blood sugar level by the use of glucagon hormone and also is to reduce the blood sugar level by the use of insulin hormone. So don't forget that functions of the pancreas. So the other function of the liver is production of red blood cells for the fetus. So the liver also is the main organ which produces red blood cells for the fetus before the fetus, uh, before the fetus bone marrow becomes strong enough to now start producing the blood cells. So the fetus and the baby is the liver which is responsible for producing the blood cells. Apart from that, the other function of the liver is that the liver um, regulates temperature in the body. So the temperature of the body falls below the normal temperature. What will happen is that the liver will increase metabolic activities, its metabolic activity. If the liver increases its metabolic activity, remember this, blood is passing through the liver. So if the liver in has increased its metabolic activity, it is going to increase in temperature. So it's going to increase in temperature. Now the blood passing through the liver, as it passes through the liver, the blood is going to be warmed. As the blood is being warmed, remember the blood is circulating the whole body. So as the blood is being warmed in the liver and then circulates the whole body, it is going to now warm the whole body as it is circulating. So that is now raising the body temperatures. So when the body temperatures are now high, the metabolic processes of the liver are going to reduce. If the metabolic processes of the liver are going to reduce, it will mean that the liver temperatures are going to go low. If the liver temperatures will go low, that blood passing through the liver, it is going to be cooled down. As this blood is being cooled down in the liver, remember, it is also circulating through the whole body. And it's circulating through the whole body. What's going to happen? The body temperatures are also going to they are also going to decrease or decline or reduce back to normal body temperatures. Biology.